Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Kevin Gover. I'm the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. Welcome to our museum. Uh, it's uh, our great honor to have you here. Uh, our museum was established in 1989 by an act of Congress, uh, so we'll turn 25 next year. Uh, as some of you, well, you're all local, I'm sure. Um, this, this building actually opened in 1990, no, I'm sorry, in 2004. So next year will be the 10th anniversary of the opening of this building. And I want you all to know as well, <laughs> want you to know as well that we have a museum in New York. So if you find yourself there with some time on your hands, please visit us in New York City. Um, we, as I say, we're, we're very honored to have you here tonight. We're so glad you're here. We're very excited about the event. And uh, to, uh, to begin our proceedings this evening, please welcome Michelle Martin. Hello, 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 hello. As Kevin said, I am Michelle Martin. I'm host of NPR's Tell Me More, which you can hear on your local NPR station. <laughs> WAMU and around the country. And I think I speak for everybody here when I say, Diva's in the house, Diva's in the house, Diva's in the house. <sighs> Pull it back. Pull it back. <laughs> May I please have the honor of recognizing Her Excellency, Dr. Tebelelo Mazile Seretsi, who is the ambassador from Botswana to the United States. Will you please? Welcome her. We're so glad you're here. And your family, if I may mention in the uh, African way, you bring your village. Thank you. <laughs> Before we get started, a few housekeeping points. We are recording. So if we could please ask you nicely to turn off your electronics. Uh, please keep your excitement uh, within yourself, to the degree that you can. Um, we will have questions and answers at the end of the, not the end, but you know, we will have time to have it be a dialogue, so be ready for that. Uh, I know you're going to be excited about that. Can I remind you to go to the National Museum of African Art Facebook page and like it, because we know you like it. And that way you can hear about all the exciting doings, or better still, you can become a member of the National Museum of African Art by going to africa.si.edu. You should have received a membership brochure on the way in. Um, you know, being at NPR, you know I'm used to saying this. Your support really does allow <laughs> <laughs> the National Museum of African Art to bring you this great programming. It really is true. Uh, and you know you are in for a treat, because if you've been to any of the director's discussions before, that you know how awesome it is, but if you haven't been, then you are in for a treat. Um, previous guests have been the amazing Marcus Samuelson, Dr. Maya Angelou, uh, Kwame Apia, um, and today, well, well, <laughs> we know why you wore your 20 minute shoes and stood in line for two hours. <laughs> we know, we know, we know. Now, I know you know these divas, and I know that they do not need much introduction, but just because we have to give them their propers, I will tell you that you know how Director Cole, when you come to the Museum of African Art, how she always says, welcome home, right? Don't you ever hear her say that? So we want you to feel at home. Um, and one of the ways we want you to feel at home is just knowing a little bit about each of these divas that you may not already know. You know bef that she was appointed director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in March of 2009. Now, of course, many of you know her and benefited from her long and distinguished career as an educator. She is the only person to have served as president of both historically black colleges founded for women, Spellman in the house. <laughs> Bennett, Bennett in the house. Too many honorary degrees and honors to count for her scholarly and civic work. And of course, the other diva of the evening, three-time Grammy award-winning singer, songwriter, New York Times best-selling poet, critically acclaimed actress, and number one album in the country, um, 
cinematic debut in Hound Dog and Tyler Perry's Why Did I Get Married, lead role in the BBC HBO series, The Number One Ladies Detective Agency. <laughs> I know I've made you wait long enough. Without further ado, Janetta Betch Cole and Jill Scott. <laughs> My sister Jill, did you want tea? Um, I think that's. I think you should have that one because it puts you suffice. closer to the tea. You're okay with yeah, the water? I'm fine. Okay, all right, I'm fine. But because of the Switch. mics, I think okay. we need to. And anyway, we, that means we get to walk across the stage a little bit more. <laughs> I know you wish you were in this chair. <laughs> but I'm going to do the best I can for you. Sister Jill. Yes. I want to begin this conversation first by doing what my mama told me it's always good to do. Just say thank you. Oh. Say thank you to you. There have to be at least 1,463 other places you could be tonight. <laughs> and you are here with us. Thank you for having me. I want to thank my extraordinarily righteous, wonderful brother, the director of the National Museum of the American Indian, Kevin Gover. We're in his house. We're in the house of all of his people who remind us, American Indians do remind us, with all living things we must be kin. So this is our house too, y'all. And I want to say thank you to my amazing and grace-filled Sister Ambassador Saretsi from Botswana. We feel so incredibly close to each other that sometimes I wonder why they separated us at birth. <laughs> and then finally to my, my colleagues. This extraordinary group of women and men of the National Museum of African Art who make all of this possible. Now, to begin our conversation, I thought we should talk about where you come from. And I don't mean Philly. OK. <laughs> and where I come from, and where every living human being and the late have come from. Because it's the only place on Earth that is the cradle of humanity. We ought to start out by talking about Africa. Yes. Just share with us at least some of those special experiences of seven months living in Botswana. Oh, wow. Oh, can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, uh, Botswana. It's Botswana. You live in Botswana. You speak Setswana, and you are Mutswana. <laughs> that's, that's first. <laughs> um, I had the privilege and pleasure of going there uh, with Anthony Minghella, who um, was directing the number one ladies detective agency. And he told me, he gave me Africa, like, a, mm -hmm. like on a silver platter. He told me before we got off the plane that the first and most important thing that I must do is humble myself and keep your eyes open and your ears and your belly <laughs> and your head, just be fully open to what Africa is. Because I had never gone, I expected some things. I expected that I would 
you fall to the ground and kiss the earth mm. and you know, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't my experience. What I discovered is that um, Africa isn't rude. She don't jump on you. She's delicate. And the next thing you know, you are the color of the earth. I was red, a color I had never been before. I was really authentically red like the dust. I smell different, I, I walk different. Um, Africa is, is very polite and uh, beautiful beyond true words. What we see on television mm -hmm. is that um, there's war and poverty and um, uh, hunger and uh, separation, but it's funny because that's what we have here. And um, mm. I just imagine that if we only showed McDonald's on television all over the world, that that's what the world would think of us, that we're the people that eat at that place with the big yellow golden arches, and that's all they would ever think about us too. So I got there and um, I found the people to be so beautifully respectful towards one another. Women can walk, Putswana is a, a, a country, but um, Habarone is the city that I spent most of my time in. And y you can walk in the middle of the night anywhere. You, nobody's gonna harm you. What you hear about is that women are raped constantly in Africa. You know, that's a, it's a big continent. <laughs> it ain't a country. <laughs> right, it's a, it's a big continent. And it's important to, to separate these things. You know, all of America is not Cleveland, you know? It's not fair, it's not a fair portrayal of an entire continent. Um, Botswana was never involved with um, apartheid, uh, from my understanding. Folks came with their guns and their uh, anger and, and um, the Mutswana people shot everybody who came to the, to the, <laughs> to the gates in, in, my, in my line. <laughs> they, they were like, oh, no, 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 no. We heard about what you do over there. You're not going to do that here. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's black folks on the money. And uh, which may, I, I know. I, I stared at that alone. I have every coin, every dollar in, and uh, what is Pula? The Pula. I have every one just because it's so beautiful. The artwork is so beautiful. And the people are, like I said, so respectful to, one, to each other uh, and helpful and, and funny and intelligent. I'm going to say I met a lot of people. Um, I went, I slept in a presidential suite. <laughs> Sometimes, and sometimes I slept in a tent, and sometimes I was in a, a shack, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I was at fancy parties at the ambassador, the American ambassador's house, and sometimes I was, um, I was in the hood drinking, <laughs> drinking beer, sitting on the steps. Ooh. You know, honestly, <laughs> this is this is the best experience of a of a place that I've ever had because I was able to live there. I wasn't on a bus and they're saying, oh, to the left or to the right, you know, you have this building and these people and, you know, there's someone dancing a dance that they don't really feel like doing today. Mm -hmm. And you can see it and feel it. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my experience, you know. Um, it, it taught me to be, resp You'll, if you notice, uh, when I meet people, this is the greeting. You know, I put my hand here and I shake hands first. A lot of people want to hug. I don't do that first. Um, one, because I don't know you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it is no love lost, but I don't know you. One. Two, you may have had a funky day. You know what I mean? <laughs> And that's, that's, I may have had a funky day. You don't, we don't know what the situation is. And, <laughs> and I, I just, I just feel that that's the best way to start out. Botswana taught me that. 
um, when I'm receiving something or, or giving something, it's done this way with my hand and I put my hand mm -hmm. here because that means I'm actually giving something to you. In the United States, we're like, huh, here you go, mm -hmm. and keep it moving, whether it's your change or your food or your, your children sometimes. Here you go, have a good day. You know, um, I learned that there. I think that it's really important to travel to the continent mm -hmm. and spend as much time as you can in each place. And don't just do what, you know, a, a tourist does because you're not, you're not really learning anything. If I come to Philadelphia and all I do is go see the Liberty Bell and I see the art museum and I see the Ben Franklin Institute, you know, that's really cool. But there's places in Philadelphia that um, musicians don't show up till two o'clock in the morning and there's smoke in the room. Yup, smoke. <laughs> <laughs> There's smoke in the room, and there's a 78-year-old bass player with a cigarette hanging right here mm -hmm. that is t speaking in numbers while he plays. Oh, yes. You know, that's, that's the magic of it all. If you just go to where, you know, the tours go, you'll be missing out on so much, mm. probably yourself. And what I learned, <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, I kept bumping into myself which mm. I think was the best part of it all. I fully believe I'm Mutuana. You can't tell me anything different. <laughs> you can't tell me anything different, and not because I want to be, but because I literally just kept bumping into myself. I saw my neighbors, I saw family members, I saw my mother, I saw Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> the little boy came in, I said, my God. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is, what's your name? He was not Michael Jordan. He was only about 5'7", but he, they had the exact same facial structure, the set, exact same color, the exact same smile. You know, regardless of how long we've been in the United States or if we've only been, you know, in D.C., if we've never gone anywhere, just know that your connection to the mother continent is not erased because of time it, at all. I promise you. There's a wonderful saying, Jill. You could take us out of Africa, but you can't take Africa out of us. No, you can't. No, you, you can't. absolutely can't. You can't. And I think that that is what um, Africans must understand as well. You know, there's a separation, which really hurts my feelings. Mm. Um, I know what that do you we're mean, here. A separation. Well, I've learned just recently that. Um, a lot of, of African people, um, no particular group, they just don't connect with us or want to. Mm -hmm. um, and we are white. And um, there's nothing wrong with being white, if I was. <laughs> you know, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, uh, it, it, it really hurt my feelings to, I mean, imagine if you, you know, you're third generation American, but your parents are both Scottish and you go to Scotland, they're like, you're not one of us. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that thing's got some sting on it, yeah. you know, um, and I just, I just feel that there's, we have to connect. Mm -hmm. We have to continuously connect with one another because we are connected. We by DNA is deeper than than where we live. You know, it's so much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you I walked into myself over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And I want to tell you that you made a contribution to dealing with that divide between African people on that continent and Africa's people in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And the way you did that was simply by being that extraordinary first lady detective. Thank you. <laughs> we saw, and we saw, we saw Botswana, yes. and by extension, Africa in an incredibly different way. Yes. And to tell you the truth, Jill, that's what we're trying to do at a place called the National Museum of African Art, 
to help people rethink how they think about Africa. Right, right. But you know, we, we're connected in yet another way. You collect art. Yeah. Fess up, <laughs> don't you? Um, you collect I'm actually art. really proud of it. Talk I don't know. about it then. <laughs> Uh, when I was a child, my mother and I would go to the art museum in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It was free until two o'clock on Sunday. So we were, um, we went to the Kingdom Hall as Jehovah Witnesses, and we would rush out of there and go to the art museum. And I watched my mother, who is six foot one, uh, very strong, very graceful. This, I don't know if you all remember a snatchback. It's like a, one of those like feather oh, yeah. hairdos. She was somebody, honey. And just fabulous, and she smelled of jungle gardenia. Ugh, oh, you couldn't tell me anything about my mother. You still can. But um, going to the art museum with her, and I don't recall what the pieces were, but sometimes she would stand in front of a piece and weep openly, ball even sob with the, <laughs> mm. that was the first time, you know, that's when she let me know how art can affect, how it can and touch and move the soul. So at that point, I started to look at art differently. Um, and not just something to hang on the wall, mm -hmm. but something to speak to who you are and how you feel and what you want and the, the quietest place in the back of your mind or the, the strength that you don't know is there. Mm -hmm. You know, you can uh, affirm your life with the art on the wall, as well as display your life with the art that's on your wall, mm -hmm. too. Um, I discovered Salvador Dali. Uh, I think his, his work still blows me away. Um, from the, the abstract pieces, from the melting clocks. I just think that he was uh, a genius, and he knew it definitely knew it. Mm -hmm. This man put every little bit of himself inside of his artwork, which is the reason that I say the things that I say in poetry and in song. He's, he's the reason for it. He would put semen inside the paint. He would put blood, tears, urine, poop. Um, <laughs> he put pieces of skin you know, any parts of himself to make sure that he legitimately lived on inside of that work. Yeah. And I'm not cutting my skin for y'all, you know. <laughs> I'm not. You love us, but. I love you, but, you know, but he's the reason why I have to, um, I guess, be really vulnerable within mm -hmm. the work mm -hmm. because, of, because of Salvador Dali and his pieces. Uh, a few years ago, I was in D.C. How about that? I was in D.C. and I'm roaming around and I see that they have, you know, they're telling me they have Salvador Dali in this little tiny uh, gallery. And it had all kinds of stuff in there. You have the, like a junkyard sale. And I go through and I find this piece. And I'm like, okay, don't freak out. Don't freak out. <laughs> don't freak out. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> how much, um, how much is it? This little piece here. This little thing, you know, you got here. Mm. How, how much, how much is it? And he tells me, and what I discovered at that moment is that you can put fine art on layaway. <laughs> I had no idea. It's the way I bought my Picasso. <laughs> it's the way I bought my Romare Bearden, my Elizabeth Catlett. You know, I just put stuff on layaway. <laughs> oh, Jill, I love Until it. Until I can, you know, get it out. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And somehow we, we, we think that it would be disrespectful to speak to this gallery owner, this artist, but they really want the work to be loved. Yes. And if you can do that on the layaway plan, <laughs> go for it. That's right. Go <laughs> for it. Yes. 
So when you were in Botswana, what did you what did you find speaking to you in terms of visual arts or in terms of music or in terms of spoken word? Because our folk on the continent do do spoken word oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Um, mostly for me, it was the fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, I I brought jet. I was pregnant the last time I was in Botswana, so I um, I got a lot of fabrics for his bed and I made him a, a quilt. Uh, that was the gist of most of it. I was really disappointed, I do have to say, that the majority of the work that I found, sculptures, were made in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy about that. No. <laughs> that, uh, no. You know, having to find pieces, you, you know, you really have to go into remote areas, mm -hmm. you know. Um, like, but I like, loved... Like Guetta, you know, I did find a... I found um, a man. <laughs> the guy is, he's made out of wood. He's about this tall, but he's bent over and he's looking up at his own behind. <laughs> and it's called self-doctoring. <laughs> <laughs> now that was made in Botswana. <laughs> oh, Jill, you know, if I sat here and strung out your talents, they are multiple. If I string out the genres of music that you comfortably move between, if I string out who you are as an African-American, a woman, you're Jet's mama. Mm -hmm. You're your mama's daughter. Yes. You're your grandma's grandchild. You have multiple talents, performing multiple genres. You have multiple identities. How do you keep all your bad selves together? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. It's funny, I was just talking about this on Twitter like yesterday. Uh, I was saying that it's, it's absolutely mandatory to disappear. I gotta get out of here. I, and I just mean out of the world. My grandmother always said, be in the world, but not of it. Mm -hmm. And I travel a lot. I go to so many different countries to perform and cities and around the world. And it's exquisite, it's a wonderful experience. I'm from North Philadelphia. So the thought of going to New York was a gigantic deal, you know, just to see New York City. But now I'm, you know, in Istanbul chilling, mm. you know, <laughs> like, like this is, this is amazing life, but um, home is very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't play with the paparazzi. I don't, I just don't, I don't, I just don't want to be a part of that life. It doesn't interest me. Um, so I go home and I, I live, in, um, I live in California, and I ride my bike every day, and I go get my own groceries, and I talk mm -hmm. to my neighbors, and I play at the park. And, <laughs> you know, I try to keep my, my, myself very simple. I make my son breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, I iron his clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, um, I don't want to get lost. I don't, I don't want to lose what I love about myself because I, you know, some people will consider me a celebrity. You know, I don't, I don't want to lose me to, to any of it. Mm -hmm. And I know me that if I get to a point where I start to lose myself, I will retreat. I, I know me. I'm, I, you know, maybe I'm a sucker, you know, a punk. <laughs> but I just, um, I, I hold it so valuable when, um, when I was always singing, but I just didn't let anybody know. I didn't think it was anybody's business, really. And when my neighbors found out, because I had a video, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when my neighbors found out, you know, the same neighbors who would barely speak were like, oh my God, damn, you know. <laughs> I'm like, I just saw you yesterday. It wasn't even that deep, but today it's different. Um, I, I just, 
it hurt my feelings more so than anything else. That now I was special, or now I was worth a good morning. You know, now I've, I've been the same girl sweeping your front because that's what my grandmother told me to do. I've, mm -hmm. I've been the same girl going to school, going to the store for you for free for years, and now I'm now I'm special. Mm -hmm. So uh, after the first record, which did really well, sold two, two million records plus, I I disappeared because it, it just it just felt wrong mm -hmm. in a sense. You know, I the whole putting man on a pedestal thing. It bothers me. Um, it bothers me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so here I am, and I've got, I've got. I literally had, I don't know, maybe four, five hundred marriage proposals. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, Jill. I, it, it, I saw a, a lot of women with flowers in their hair and, you know, some had shaved the back off and they were wearing denim skirts and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> this is really freaky mm -hmm. to me. So I retreated and I hid in my house uh, doing simple things. I learned to garden. I'm not very good at it, but I tried <laughs> for about a year before I even considered recording anything. And then the, it was time. I have to sing. Ugh. I have to. It's, it's, it's not about anything else, but I have to. So it was time, and I was, you know, itching to record something. And I went into the studio, and somewhere in the back of my mind, I, I decided that I wasn't going to do as well, that I was going to make people forget me because this was a bit much, you know, just all of the rah-rah, I don't know, it was a bit much for me. I didn't know how to handle it because I like to catch the bus. <laughs> I do, I still do. I like to catch the bus. I like to watch. I'm a writer. I'm a writer who happens to sing. I'm an artist that happens to be entertaining. It's, it, you know, this is just the way it went for me. So, you know, being on the bus and watching people have conversations, um, arguments, <laughs> listening to people on the telephone, watching people fall in love, old couples um, who, there was a couple. There was this couple. I guess they were maybe, I don't know, I was, I was a kid, so they were, maybe 65, 68, somewhere around that family. Had to be older than that. Had to be older than that. But as a kid, you know how your perception is. If you're 40, so, you're old. Oh yeah, you're old. <laughs> I'm, I'm ma'am now, that <laughs> trips me out. So I, this couple would always get on the bus and she, he would sit behind her, not next to her. And I would watch the two of them, something would happen out the window, and at the exact same time, they would both look. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was perfectly synchronized. And I thought, oh, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So all of that disappeared for me, because no matter where I went, I was the, the, you know, what everybody was looking at, you know, and uh, it freaked me out. So I thought, okay, I'm going to destroy my career and I'm going to do songs that nobody is going to like. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> but Golden was on it. <laughs> I mean, I remember saying to myself, nobody's gonna like this because, you know, I knew what I was talking about. I was in the process, I knew I was on my way to divorce. And I, you know, that was my declaration. And it was really only for me. You know, I'm taking my freedom. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but surprise, surprise. It was on the Golden Globes. <laughs> and I came to grips with it. 
And I said, okay, there's nothing you can do about what God gives you. There's oh, yes. no way to hide. There's no way to dismiss yourself from it. What's the point, you know? So at that point, I said, all right, I will. <laughs> I'll do all the things that I can do. And then I put out a book and then I started acting publicly. I was in theater for years before. Um, Spoken word was your absolutely. first medium. Absolutely. I think it's really important um, for actors or, or writers to have some varying degree of, of poetry in your life. Um, you are on a stage with no music, no backup singers, no fancy lights. It's just you and your words. It doesn't matter the notes that you speak them in as long as you're speaking the truth. Performance poetry is different because it's acting. I never did that. I never got involved in performance poetry. I actually stood on stage and I read the words because in my mind, this is just me, but in my mind, it's the words that matter more than anything else. And it's not the delivery of the words, it is the words. It's the word. But that's itself. my opinion. And um, that gave me, it opened, my, it opened every door for me. So here I am naked and on the stage with some words that uh, mean something to me, that mm -hmm. I have literally poured over, and eraser uh, lint is in my lap, and I got ink on my face, and it keeps me up at night, and I read something, and I look out at the audience, and they're touched, laughing, crying, um, staring, leaving, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> depending on what I've said, and I thought this is magical. Um, a guy named Ozzy Jones, a director out of Philadelphia, came to a performance and I was getting $15 a night to, to read poetry. And he says, I think you're an actor. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said, um, I'm, I'm going to look for some things for you. I said, okay. You know, kept it moving. Poetry, another poetry night. Instead of, I got halfway through a poem. And the thing was, I got halfway through this poem, but I had been shot at for the first time in my life across the street from my house the night before. Some guy Chill. that was high, uh, you know, kept calling me Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was pretty high. He was high. He, he was <laughs> He's pretty all the way gone, and I was sitting in the car with my friend, and he kept calling me Vincent. And hey, Vincent, I said, I'm not Vincent. My friend says, I'm not Vincent, and I know she's not. <laughs> and out of nowhere, he just pulled out a gun, and my friend sped off, but the guy shot at us, and it was really sad. It was very, very sad. So I wasn't okay. And then that next day, I went to a poetry reading. I couldn't even get dressed. I had on, I wore pajamas to the poetry reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sharp pajamas. <laughs> oh, I know. Sharp pajamas. The thrift store is a broke girl's friend. <laughs> yes, I found some fabulous pajamas that my mother had gotten me from this thrift store in the good neighborhood. And, um, <laughs> I wore those pajamas to work and to the poetry reading. And I got to a certain point in the poem and I just had to sing. I had to. I kept my voice to myself because I thought that if anybody hears this, they're going to like it or they're not going to like it. And I don't want that to matter to me. This feels good. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want anybody to taint it or celebrate it before I'm ready to celebrate it. Mm -hmm. You know, this just feels good to me. It's the right thing for me to do. A sad, happy, going to the store, trying to remember uh, how to spell an encyclopedia. You know, whatever the case was, you know, music, singing had become a part of it. And um, I just, that night I sang and it was still. And for some reason I wasn't afraid and then everybody just burst into applause. And I said, okay. <laughs> okay, 
I will, I'll do this too. And then I was coming from school. I love this life of mine, I swear to you, I do. I was coming from school, I was at Temple University. I was coming from school and um, coming from teaching, I was going to be an English teacher. And I was really frustrated because it just didn't feel like there was any support. Mm -hmm. And it made me angry, you know. No support for teachers. The floors were gray, the ceiling was gray, the lockers were gray. It, it felt like I was being defeated before I got a chance to teach anything. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew if I felt like that, how must the students feel? So I asked the principal to please give me some paper. We, we, let's collect magazines, let's do something and put some color on these walls. And he called me young and idealistic and he told me that I would get over it. And I quit. I quit that day. I just left. And it was right around the corner from my house and I'm walking home like, man. <laughs> I done work two jobs <laughs> trying to get this education. And this is something that I just don't wanna do. I don't wanna do this. If this is what it means, if there's no support for teachers who we need the most, if this is what this is gonna be, let me find something else. And I literally got to the door and the phone was ringing on the inside. And this is before cell phones, where I couldn't afford a cell phone. But um, I got to the door, the phone's ringing, I got the key, you know that, that moment where you're trying to, mm -hmm, you know, I got mm -hmm. the key in the door, I run inside, I grab the phone, and it's Ozzy Jones. And he says, there is a theater company. Hey, 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 what's, what's, what's going on? Hi, hi. There's a theater company named Arden Theater Company. It's, it's a new one. They have an apprenticeship. It's $150 a week. Uh, you'll get free acting classes and health insurance. Whoa! <laughs> You talk. You mean I could go to the doctors? <laughs> Wait a minute. $150 a week. I'm 24. Ugh. $150 is not very much for a 24 year old to survive on. $150 a week. Um, you'll get free acting classes, but you have to work 14 to 16 hours a day, six days a week you will be building a theater company. And I thought, oh, you know, putting up, putting up stuff. That'll be cute, no, no. Um, Jack hammers. Uh, I put up drywall, I broke up cement floors, I, I hung lights, I built sets, I mm -hmm. sold costumes, I worked sound. Um, and by the time I actually got to the free acting classes, I was so exhausted <laughs> that I was sleep through most of them. Couldn't help it, just mm -hmm. a mouth open, head back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they let me understudy for every play that was there, which gave me all my equity points. And it also paid for me to be in the union. So when I got out of the, mm -hmm. the theater company, out of that fellowship, uh, I, took a, I took, out of the apprenticeship, I took a fellowship at Walnut Street Theater, also $150 with health insurance. I got hooked on health insurance. <laughs> but I also had an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to really dig into acting and to, um, to grow as an actor and as a performer. And, um, I learned Sondheim and Shakespeare and um, Miller and my goodness, I read so much amazing work. Everything that I am now has come from my mother standing in an art museum crying. Mm. Thank you for doing that circle. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, you, you shared with us that um, you walked out of the classroom. Yes. You were not going to be in a situation where teaching was not respected. No. Now, you may not list this among your talents, 
but I'm going to put it there. You are a teacher. <laughs> you are a teacher. Hmm. And first of all, you are open enough, you are centered enough to teach us <laughs> even about yourself. Hmm. And for so many of us, that's a beautiful lesson. It's an extraordinary lesson. Thank you. And I have to tell you, <laughs> you know you <laughs> Jill Scott's trying to pretend <laughs> that she doesn't know that she is one of my sheroes. Come on, yo. <laughs> Wow. You know, man. <laughs> Jill, you've done so much, come so far, taught so brilliantly, and you haven't even started to get old. <laughs> huh. <laughs> so. To be where you are now, one of the things, by the way, that makes you one of my sheroes is your insistence on being self-reflective, self mm -hmm. your, 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 your dedication to constantly growing and exploring. But what in the world do you think you're going to do next? Well. Um Lately, um, chapters are coming in my sleep. Uh-oh. So it's really a pain in the neck. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that I'd like to sleep sometimes. <laughs> just, there, there are chapters that are coming. Um, there's an opera that has been in my hand and in my mouth really? and, uh, for, for years now. Um, when I was, I guess, I guess I must have been 23 mm -hmm. or 24, I decided that I was going to do a lullaby album. Um, it was around the time that the doctors in the hood uh, told me, because you go to a clinic, you know, when you're in the hood, um, they told me that I would never have children. So, a lot of them, actually. Uh, so I decided that if I were to ever have a child, I would do a lullaby album. And um, we, just, we just completed it. Now that I have a four-year-old, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to create an album like this without understanding what that love is to to you know have someone actually in your body and grow inside you and just like really love somebody that much you know I, mm. I, I had no idea I had no clue so uh, we just finished the lullaby album I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Glasper mm -hmm. yeah. um, he is, he is actually really incredible. For those of you who don't know who Robert Glasper is and are slightly interested in jazz music, slightly, um, we've, been, we've been missing out on, on jazz. Um, but this, is, this music is, is so refreshing and open that it can be played on an R&B station, it can be played on a jazz station, it can be played um, you know, pretty much anywhere and I love it. So I asked him if he would could help me with the, the Lullaby album, uh, as well as Derek Hodge, um, he plays bass. He's an absolutely incredible, he's a professor. He's um, so solid with that thing. You know, up, whether it's upright or not, he's, he's just incredible and intuitive. And he just had a little baby girl. So um, mm. Derek, who has a son, I mean, uh, 
Robert Glasper, who has a little boy who plays the drums already, he's really crazy. Um, Derek Hodge, who just had his little baby. And my, my son's father, who is um, Little John Roberts, mm -hmm. uh, he played drums on this record as well, the whole thing. And the thing, what's so amazing about John Roberts is that this is the most incredible musician I've ever heard. Drums are meant to talk. They're not just meant to keep a rhythm. They are supposed to tell a story inside the story. Mm -hmm. And these are the musicians that I gathered, the kind of musicians who not only can play anything, but also relate it without, you know, while keeping a melody, while keeping the rhythm. Mm -hmm. So um, we did it in four days. And uh, it, I'll put it to you like this. We walked away from the Lullaby album close. We walked away just pleased with, with life and with the opportunity to create something like this. Uh, the lyrics are meant to erase what's been programmed in your mind, what's been programmed in your life, whether it's a commercial, whether it's a song, whether it's what we see on the street or on the cover of magazines, it's meant to erase all of that and get to the bare basics of humanity and how mm. wonderful uh, we really and thoroughly are and how uh, loved. My example about our love or being loved <laughs> is that it was one specific night with your mother and your father <laughs> in a specific place <laughs> at a specific time and there were millions of sperm <laughs> but that one got through. You are a miracle already and that is what I pray to instill in anyone who listens to the Lullaby album. It's not just for infants, it's for grown people. Mm -hmm. So rest, rest your mind, rest your body, rest and allow your spirit to blossom and, and flow and, and glide with this music. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for this for 15 years and here it is, you know, my, um, like I said, I was told I couldn't have children. So my grandmother is the kind that would tell you her name was Blue Blues. Blue. Yeah, B-L-U, my blue baby. And blue is the kind that could tell you um, that the, who was calling before the phone would ring. <laughs> my mother is the kind that can look at you and tell you if you take a step what sex you're, of your, your child. My mother told me I was having a boy on the phone. <laughs> and normally she has to see you stand up and walk. She's never been wrong in my whole life, ever. And she's done it for, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say it's about a thousand people, strangers. You know what I mean? She's never been wrong. Um, and my aunt Annie is the one who can, it agitates me, but she will say, God wants me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so listen up. That gets on my nerves because I feel like I have a wonderful relationship with the creator and anything that he wants to tell me, he's gonna tell me. Directly. <laughs> and show me too. Mm -hmm. But about, uh, about 15 years ago when I'm all frustrated about not being able to have children and trying to let that go and move on and find my creative way or a way, um, she was like, oh, God told me to tell you, you're going to have a son. And I was like, mm-hmm. Mm. Did my? Mm. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Jill, I, I know your grandmama, wherever she is right now, up there, mm. is checking you out. Oh, yeah. And um, Calling me Miss Piss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know that uh, you named your foundation for her, yes. Blue Bay. Yes. It means a lot to many of us that you do that kind of giving back, that you just know you got to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, 
Mm -hmm. It's weird having, having anybody like, oh, you know, you give back. We're all supposed to give back. Everybody's supposed to give back. You know, give back, push forward. We were talking about this earlier mm -hmm. at lunch, and I was saying that I respect and admire the Jewish community so much because they support each other, their children are educated, hell or high water, <laughs> and they open schools which give them not only a great education, but also a history of themselves. Um, there's a rite of passage to become a man. Yeah, I mean, and you're hard pressed to find a Jewish mother that's all that geeked about you bringing your uh, Latina girlfriend home. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's this real sense of community that I think that as African Americans, we really need to pay attention to. I think it's a template. And if you don't like that template, try the Mexican community because they will make a way out of no way. And if you don't like that template, then you find the Asian community because they will stick together and they will keep their language. And it doesn't mean that because they're so um, insular doesn't mean that they, you're also secluded. You're welcome. You're welcome. Everybody's welcome. And that's the that's what I think we need to learn as a people. Mm -hmm. I think we really need to pay attention to the ones that are, to the folks that are winning at this race. <laughs> You're saying that we don't have a leader, we don't have a template. We sure do. It just may not be where you think it's, you know, supposed to come from. Right. You know, I personally feel that as much money as churches make, there should not be a single child in the United States that can't go to college. Yep, 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 agree, agree. Do you think the temple doesn't support its children in that way? I'm absolutely certain that it does. Mm -hmm. And health care and everything else, we have to really start being about it. You know, we, a lot of us are doing well, but a lot of us aren't. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, a lot of us are in a really bad way. So if you have managed to get up this morning and make yourself some breakfast, and call a friend, and pay a gas bill. You are doing something. <laughs> you are doing something. So therefore, you can, um, if you grab one kid, one kid alone, if you can visit in a school and just talk about something, mm -hmm. anything, they don't really care. They're just happy to learn anything. If it's an adult that you can assist in some way, just you know, do it. this is just do it. It's not deep. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to parade. I want, I want these kids from North Philadelphia who get the short end of the stick because they're from North Philadelphia. I know what that feels like. I want them to go to school, yeah, and I yeah. want, I want to see them grow. And they don't owe me anything but to succeed. Thank you. And to try and and grow. That's it. That's all I want. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now you will notice. <laughs> <clears throat> when we began, and you won't believe this, but it was really about an hour ago. Was it? And I thanked some very, very special folk in my life. And I didn't thank one person because I wanted to wait till now to say how Deeply, I respect and love myself. So, Michelle Ma, not just because you are such an accomplished individual, and yes, if I got on that program and you asked me to tell you more, I would spill everything. <laughs> <laughs> but because when you're not doing that, you're so sisterly. And besides that, you support the National Museum of African Art. <laughs> so, Michelle, would you come up and just let, um, you've got to do this, because there's no way I could make this work. 
There are 300 and some odd people in here who have 900 different questions they want to <laughs> ask. So how are you going to do this? Well, I was hoping we could see. bring the lights up a little bit. Can we bring up the house lights? Good. Nice. So we can see each other. Always a good thing. And do we have some roving mics, or shall I just repeat? No. There's one here. Where's another one? There's one here. There's any others? One here, just Okay, and uh, what about some of you who uh, can't get to the mic? What are we going to do? So we'll just walk around. Okay, then why don't we, can I bring up the lights in the back just so I can see everybody? Nope, that's as good as we get. What if somebody in the back has a question? <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's just see what we got. We'll do the best we can for about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Seven. Seven. It's a number of completion. <laughs> okay. Who has a question? We'll go here. Okay. Here and then here. Perhaps this is the best question. Okay. Here. Here. I talk for so long. <laughs> I don't have nothing else to add. I like that t-shirt. <laughs> you may know me as Jill Scott Fins on Twitter. <laughs> yes, hi baby. How you doing? I'm good. Let me just start by saying thank you for the music that you've given us through the years because you've truly helped me um, understand not just real music but understand my soul mm. and who I want to be like um, the older I get from songs like brother even to bless you just truly inspired me in so many different ways I just want to thank you for that you're welcome um, my question is I know in the light of the sun you went the freestyle route on the new album after lullaby is coming out what type of um, music or route did you choose to go on that time? For the, for the studio album, it's a little trickier. Um, it's a lot trickier, actually. It's, it's this harmony between hip hop with the likes of Ninth Wonder and David Banner um, and jazz with, um, with obviously Robert Glasper. Uh, and reggae music and, and um, Latin music. It, you know, each time it's a stew, you know, so it's taking its time. It's taking more time than I anticipated, but it's something, it's something else. My motto is grow or die, so I just, What's, what's consistent is I like to tell stories. I like to paint pictures with words and with, with sound. So that's, con that's gonna be the same. Um, but how I do it is now the route, is, is now mm -hmm. the, you know, the journey. I'm finding new voices. I found this new one that sounds like um, Ralph Tresvant <laughs> <laughs> mixed with Michael Jackson. I was like, this is crazy. What is this one? And then I found another one that is like Michael McDonald. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but new stuff is coming out and I have to, I gotta let ride it. Out. it. You gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. I'm, I'm really happy about it, you know. It's, it's a lot of fun. She's, uh, she's sassy. She's very sassy. Um, very, um, very sassy. Very strong in, in pretty much everything. Even the vulnerabilities. Even fear. And that's, I think this is my favorite so far. Because it's, it's even strong in fear. Fear is good if you um, beat that monkey. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hello, my name is John. Hi, it's John. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I have a question. Well, first, let me say that I love your words. Thank you. I love your music. Thank you. And one of the pieces that you've written that really touches me deeply 
is family reunion. Uh. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about that? Because to me, when I, every time I play it, I feel as if you're singing about my family. <laughs> but I have to pause and say, well, she may be writing about her family. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit more about what inspired you to write that song? Are those people real in your family? Mm. Et cetera, thank you. Um, family reunion is, is, is my family, you know? Um, and if it's not members of my family, I've gone, how many family reunions have we all gone to? You know, so many of them, where you end up seeing pretty much the same people in different clothes with different faces. You know, there's always a drunk uncle, you know, who's gotta do his nasty dance in front of everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you can't wait for it. There's always some level of argument. Somebody's gonna argue and fight, and probably they may not fight, but they'll cry real hard on each other <laughs> afterwards. I mean, this is, this is our family, so it, it was, it was a way to, to just celebrate the wild and wacky, you know, ride of our people. You know, there's, there's always somebody who makes the nasty potato salad, <laughs> but brings it faithfully every year. <laughs> oh, that was Cousin Eleanor's lemon cake. Yeah, she, I don't know how she does that, but she does the whole, the lemon, um, at the yes. skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she kills that. Yeah. And then she soaks the bottom of the cake in some kind of lemon concoction she made. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Annie. Uh, thank you very much for all that you've given to us and shared. My pleasure. Um, I have, I have one comment though. You mentioned templates and I'd yes. just like to comment and say, I think we do have a, a template that we only have to reclaim our history mm. and we will reclaim our template for life, for, um, for edu to move on with education, to succeed. I think it's there. But the other thing I want to know is, um, I thought the number one ladies detective agency series was just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> We did too. Are, are, you, are you going to be doing any more? Well, um, it, I'm just going to keep holding out and hope. You know, um, it wasn't picked up by HBO, and I'm, I've never really been quite sure of why. Um, I know that I was seven months pregnant when I came back from Botswana. And there was no way that Mara Motswe, she's a big lady, but there's no way, you know, <laughs> that I could, I could make her this, uh, you know, this big, especially in this part. So um, I needed time, and I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to put my newborn baby on a flight for 17 hours. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be away from my family with a new baby either. So a part of that delay was me because nobody else's child is mine and I have to take care of him. Um, the other half of it, I really don't know. I, I believe that the show may have been a little too positive. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, that's true. It, I, that's the only thing that I can really come up with. It, it gave it gave another light to Africa, and that's all we really need. There's so many wonderful lights to this amazing continent, and uh, particularly Botswana. You know, so I don't know, and I, I'm I don't know if I'm still on the stamp. They put me on a postage stamp, oh. <laughs> oh. which is oh. pretty awesome. And that you know, it took me an hour to wait in the line and get the stamp. Because <laughs> you know, everything in Botswana takes about an hour. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's like this. This is one of my my fun facts of Botswana. Uh, the weekend comes, and the mall closes at two o'clock. And I said, but I, you know, it's the weekend. I want to have fun. I want to go to the mall. I want to see a movie. I want to hang out. And they're like, well, it's everybody's weekend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is 
so beautiful. It's everybody's yeah. weekend. What are you going to do? There you go. <laughs> That's Botswana. Oh, please. Good evening, Dr. Cole. Good evening. Uh, just got. Hi. My name is Naida Chesson, and I wanted to ask about the arts and the rise of web series and what it is that artists can do to further expose themselves if you have any advice or words of wisdom. Well, uh, to further expose themselves. I mean, the web is pretty incredible. You know, um, Twitter and Facebook and, you know, finding and creating your following is, I guess that's the point of it all. You know, uh, if you have an artist that you want seen, it's a good idea to perform everywhere for free. Uh, because of the, if you're asking for money, nobody's ready to pay you just yet. You've got to earn that. Um, I think that for longevity, you've got to earn your stripes. So um, start, if you're, I don't know, is this someone that's a singer or an actor? or? Okay, um, just perform wherever they can for free. You know, it's the burden, it's, it's the labor, but it also gives people an opportunity to get in on you at the ground level. And when people feel like they, they own a part of your journey, then you've got support for, for a lifetime. You know, so I, th I think that's, you know, a really important key to perform for free you know, wherever you can, and then to record those performances, but wait until you have um, a list of folks, you know, whether it's in your phone or on a book or whatever the case, a list of folks to direct those YouTube uh, viewers, you know, so you can say to them, hey guys, uh, put up this, you know, so they can talk about it. Word of mouth still beats everything else. You can shove and push a product down somebody's throat all you want. But, um, you know, when, when somebody says, hey, did you read, uh, what's, what's my, what's the book I'm reading now? Um, what am I, it's fiction. I and bet it's, you it's Octavia Butler, cause you love science I fiction. I do, I do. But it's not, I love, I love Octavia Butler. But I'm reading, um, I'm reading the, the sequel to The Coldest Winter. Uh, uh, what's it called? All I hear, Nena, Nena. <laughs> <laughs> a deeper love inside. And Jay California Cooper, I don't know if you're familiar with oh, her. Oh, yes. That woman, okay, I, I know we weren't supposed to talk about this. Jay California Cooper, she writes these stories, they're fiction, but they, uh, she will stop in the middle of the best color-filled story and talk to God for about four pages. <laughs> I mean, and deep and sincere, just talking to God for about four pages and then she'll jump back into the story. This transition is so smooth, you don't even know what happened. She is, uh, she's, is she 78 now? She's 78 and little, little, and sweet as sugar and smart as a whip. And um, she, she's got this one book called The Wake of the Wind. And I was on, you read it? Yeah. <laughs> I was on the plane reading The Wake of the Wind. I'm at the end, you know what I'm talking about. I was at the end of the book and something happened. I don't wanna tell you because I want you to go out and support this author. I get to this part of this book and I'm telling you, Weeping, weeping on the plane. <laughs> Deep, okay? So I, I can't stop reading because I'm so close to the end. It's now a challenge. So although I have, uh, my eyes are swollen, it's not everywhere, I finally, uh, I'm, I'm reading, 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 and I get to another part of this book. And I'm telling you, it may have been maybe 16 pages in between, maybe, and I'm crying out of joy. Joy, hands in the air, feet off the ground, laughing, bawling. And the guy next to me says, I have sinus trouble too. <laughs> Michelle.
ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador uh, from th Botswana. Thank, th thank you very much. <laughs> Dear, there is no single person in the world who has marketed Botswana to the same extent that you have. Anytime I meet anybody here and I say I'm from Botswana, they say, oh, number one lady. <laughs> <laughs> so you have done such a splendid job. Thank you. We are so indebted to you. And we will ever, in our hearts, you'll Thank always be our sister in Thank Botswana. You. Thank you. We talk about this divide. When I was a student at Morgan State University, before a lot of you were born, <laughs> before a lot of you were born, the Africa that was then was the Tarzan Africa. Today, because of the media and everything, the African American that the Africans know is what they see in television. So it is to be expected, therefore, that there would be the suspicions. The suspicions can only be brought to an end by us, the enlightened and the educated. Every, when you move all of you out of here, no one should talk about Africa, unless if we are talking about the National Museum of African Art. <laughs> there is no such thing as Africa. So therefore, when you say, I haven't been to Africa, we don't know what you're talking about. You have 54 countries. If today you and I go to Senegal, which is French speaking, all I can say is bonjour. Beyond that, I can say anything else. So therefore, the media has manipulated the continent of Africa that all you see it's negative to make you to fear to go there. It's negative to continue the divide. So somebody stayed in Botswana seven months. She came back, wasn't eaten by a lion. <laughs> but the image, the image that a lot of people have about Africa it's is true. they are going to step out of the plane and they are going to be eaten. <laughs> I have two lawyer friends, African Americans, who also just visited me. And in Botswana, as Jill was saying, we are very modest. So I said to them, okay, uh, you know, if you don't mind, you can share with me at my little house or whatever. They told me when they they got back, they said, you know, girl, we didn't know whether to take the mattress or, or exit. They brought canned food, they brought. <laughs> they didn't end up using any of that because we cooked for them and we, we celebrated their being there and they had bedroom and suites. I was just talking to my sister here that I just came from holiday in Kenya went to see a ruin called Getty because I have seen Europe. I have made it my mission to visit other African countries so that I can learn. We found a monument 800 years old in Africa. 800 years old, they had bedroom and suites. They were showing us as we were going through that this is the bathroom, this is the bed here. I said, they had in Africa 800 years ago. Why? Because I too have been taught that Africans are barbaric, uncivilized, you know, no sense of fashion. Hey, look at the Nigerian women and see how they tie those scarves there and tell me there's no one with sense of fashion. So the IMF right here, the next seven fastest growing economies are in Africa. So the choice is yours. Are you going to be left out of that growth? This is why the Chinese, Jill, are seeing it. Mm. Other people are seeing it. 
We can read, we can Google, you can Google me, but you are not going, you are not going to know me until we sit over coffee and you say, you know, what's your deal? And I tell you what my deal is. So let us get up and go and see. If you plan in advance, you plan 15 months in advance, tickets are cheaper. But if you just get up and you say, I'm going, it's going to be more expensive. In terms of Botswana, US passport, no visa required. Our embassy, right here by DuPont Circle, stop by there. When you come, we give you tea. We tell you about it. is more peaceful than the United States. Go and Google the Global Peace Index. Botswana is the number two country in the world. Profitability. Profitable index, go and Google it. <laughs> Botswana is the number one producer of diamonds. This is why you see jail with all these diamonds. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we are inviting you to come and visit us. The embassies are all lined there. Go there, talk to us. We won't bite you. We love you, and you'll always be a part of us. All of us, white, yellow, we are all Africans. Thank you. Thank you. Director Cole, thank you. Jill Scott, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Oh, dear. Thank you so much. I really did unplug my mic, which is probably better anyway. Uh, I will sing. <laughs> um, you can sit down if you want to, it's okay. <laughs> I know you wore those 20 minute shoes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not. Um, a few years ago, I was uh, shook out of my sleep and as a as a um, writer and anybody in here that is a writer you know that when it's coming out you have to catch it you have to be obedient to it or it will go it doesn't owe you anything you know it's a it's a gift not a given so uh, I was woke up shook pretty violently and um, I happened to catch it the whole thing <laughs> came out in a, a line, and I heard this. Um, it said, um, if you'd be so kind as to not videotape so that you actually have a moment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, 
just be mindful in the in the world of, of videotaping and taking pictures that um, just think of me sometimes sometimes there are people who are so excited about the picture that they actually miss the conversation <laughs> or the information or you know all that stuff so here it is this is um, I heard this um, you seem to have a mystery of me I am here to broach it I am he who resides in everything growing and glowing I how, let me see how does it go it goes like this um doom <laughs> Let me see if I can remember. <laughs> you seem to have a mystery of me. I am here to broach it. I am he who resides in everything growing and glowing. <laughs> I can't remember. Oh, I know. I am not one to try and hide. I am here and I show it. Make no mistake, Satan is the father of lies. But I'm father to him and all of them. And you are light, do you understand? What you feel inside? Dunna, dunna, dunna. Hey, oh, hey. Do you understand what you feel inside? Dunna, dunna, dunna. Oh, I see we got it now. <laughs> dunna, dunna, dunna. Wow, 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 wow. Look at your light bright. Do you know how bright you are to me? You're a homemade star in my sight. And I'm guiding you, constantly moving. There is a reason for your life. You'll never understand it. It's my plan. Just have faith in me with all your might. Just have faith in me. In you I light. Do you understand? What you feel inside. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. at the National Museum of African Art.